Well, good morning. Glad to have you here this morning with us. For those that may not know, uh, my name is Brian Robertson. I'm the lead pastor here at the church, and I'm very grateful to have you uh, worship alongside us, to choose to be a part of our worship gatherings this weekend as we gather in the name of Jesus, as we ever do every weekend, to be reminded of who God is, who we are, and what God may be calling us to do. Uh, if you are new here, I want to extend my special welcome to you as well. And if you have a little bit of time this morning, maybe a little patience with me, uh, I'd like to meet you personally. I'll be up here in the front part of the, of the worship center. You can just kind of come up. I'd like to just extend my special greeting to you and, and very grateful to have you. We're in the, uh, nearing the end, but in the middle of this fall teaching series that we're calling The Way of the Table, where we're seeking to understand the centrality and the importance of the communion table, the Lord's Supper, in our fellowship and in our worship. The communion table, as many of you know, has been centrally located in the Christian worship for generations, thousands of years. The, cent- the centerpiece of Christian worship has been the communion table. And so we've been spending these last couple of weeks exploring what happens at the table, what we experience at the table, and not just what we're doing, just kind of going through the motions kind of thing, but what does it do to shape us to be kingdom kind of people as we leave from this place? What we experience at the table, in other words, the ethics and the value systems of the kingdom of God that we see on display at the table and we experience when we receive the Lord's Supper, we are to be that kind of people. It is to shape us to be that kind of people wherever God send us, sends us into our communities. If you've been here the last couple of weeks, you know that we've looked at the hospitality of the table, that the welcome sign at the table is there for all people of all walks of life, and that, that ought to shape us to be the kind of people that extend hospitality to those around us. And last week, if you were here, we looked at the reconciliation of the table, how this table reconciles us to God, and how it ought to shape us to be reconciling people in and around our communities. Well, this morning, we're going to look at the ethic or the value systems of the table. As Bob read in our scripture reading this morning, we're going to look at the ethic of sacrificial serving that we see at the table. The sacrificial servanthood of Jesus as we see him gathered at the Lord's table. And as we get into it this morning, as we understand what God may be teaching us, let's pray that God would open our hearts, that he would respond, that we might be able to respond to his calling on our life this morning. So let's pray together and then we'll jump into the message this morning. Jesus, we are humbled at your grace in our life. We're humbled that you've called us to this place and that you've given us your word that we might uh, encounter you this morning, that we may come face to face with who you are and may it shape us to be kingdom people, Christ-like people in this world. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, Jesus, in the washing of his disciples' feet that we read about just moments ago when Bob read from John 13, Jesus, in washing in his, his disciples' feet, utterly disrupts the power struggle of his day. Utterly turns it on its head. Utterly disrupts the systems of the world of the prevailing culture of one-upmanship, of hierarchy, of, of powering over those people around us. And he demonstrates the way of selfless, sacrificial kind of servanthood. And displays and models for the Christ follower a, a way of life that we ought to follow in our own days and whether, wherever we are. Whether it's in the classroom or in the field or in the factory or in the office. That we ought to be people that follow Christ. And there are tons of different things that we could dive into about Jesus washing his disciples' feet. We could talk about the ceremonial cleaning. We could talk about the water basins that were used. We could talk about the role of servanthood and, and the, sacri- or the, the slave's role and all that kind of stuff. We can talk about all that stuff, but for this morning, I simply want the image of Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, washing dirty feet to speak for itself. I want you to listen and to hear the story, and I want you to place yourself at the table there as you experience Jesus, the second person of the eternal God, washing dirty feet. That as the table is going on, as dinner is happening, he gets up from the table, he goes over and puts a towel around his waist, and you're at the table, and one at a time, Jesus begins washing people's feet. 
and to allow that image, to allow what you are experiencing, to allow it to speak for itself. There's tons of theological things we can talk about, things we can dive into the Scriptures for sure. But let the story speak for itself. What are you experiencing when you experience Jesus at that table upsetting the power structure of the world and washing your feet and the feet of your friends. You see, our self-righteousness, and I just let me be real autobiographical for a second. My self-righteousness and my desire to think highly of myself and to have others think highly of myself Or have others think highly of me? My self-righteousness is confronted by Jesus at the table. And maybe yours is too. My self-righteousness and my temptation to think more highly of myself is confronted by the Jesus I encounter at the table. Who willingly takes on the towel around his waist and washes feet. The one who wrapped a towel, washed the feet of my friends, and comes to me and washes my feet. Well, this is the same one who calls me to follow his way. This is the same one who calls me to follow his way. And once again, we see the contrast between the ethic or the value system of the kingdom of God on one hand, and the ethics and the value systems of the prevailing culture on the other hand. I see the kingdom of God, the ethic or the value system in the kingdom of God is one of humility and selfless, sacrificial servanthood on the one side. And yet the ethics, the value system of our prevailing culture is one marked of hierarchy, of superiority, of of knowing who's on the pecking order and where you land on the org chart. And the power struggle that we live in has been part of the human story from almost the very beginning. Because as soon as sin entered the world, pecking order entered the world, hierarchy entered the world. And where I stand in relationship to other people and making sure that I can have other people think more highly of myself, all that entered the world when sin entered the world. And it has been wreaking havoc in our world and in our relationships ever since. But at the table of God, at the Lord's table, There's a different way. There's a different ethic. There's a different value system. Not based on power struggle or hierarchy or who's on on the the org chart or wherever else you may play yourself, but one that is based on the loving, selfless, sacrificial servanthood of the king. Where we see on display at the table a different value system, a different ethic. And what we see and what we experience at the table ought to shape us to be that kind of person wherever God is sending us. The church, the Christian church is to be a fellowship marked by humble, selfless, sacrificial servanthood. Why? Because we follow Jesus. And this is what Jesus is known for. The church, the Christian church, ought to be a fellowship of people who selflessly, willingly, and sacrificially serve one another and our community as a whole. Because we follow Jesus. And what we see in Jesus at the table is selfless, sacrificial, willing service. The Apostle Paul picks up on this in his letter to his friends in Philippi in the second chapter of Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 7. And he writes this to his friends. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. Being found in in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And what I want us to consider this morning is servanthood that we see at the table. 
And we see Jesus, the servant, washing his feet, the feet of the disciples. And the way of Christ, the way of the servant Christ, is one not of power struggle or one-upmanship or hierarchy, but one that is humble in nature, selfless and sacrificial. We ought to be servants in our world. We ought to place ourselves and serve one another. And here's just the raw, honest truth. Most of us, probably the majority of us, know this. And we know it up here. Intellectually, we know it's the right answer. We know that it's better to serve than to demand that other people serve you. We know that it's better not to walk around with a puffed up ego and a head that's this big and just being arrogant, fill in the blank. We know that it's better not to be arrogant and prideful and egocentric. It's better to be humble and to be servanthood and to, and to give of ourselves. We know that intellectually, but we remain stuck. And we have a difficult time developing a culture of servanthood. We fall back into the temptation of power struggle and hierarchy and, and having other people think highly of us. We will fall back into the temptation of finding our value and our reputation and our popularity. And so this morning, as we stare right at Jesus, the servant, I want to ask us, how do we make strides? And not just nod our head and say, yeah, that's the right thing. We should serve and people should serve. But what can we do to overcome the obstacles or the hurdles that are in our way to be really Christ-like servant people wherever God is sending you wherever God is sending you and as we pursue this I've got three quick things or thoughts that that at least I want us to consider for a moment and the first one is that we need to check our motives we need to check our motives see the disciples had left everything to be with Jesus they wanted to be mentored by him they wanted to follow him they wanted to listen to him they wanted to hang out with Jesus they had left everything their families their their friends they left their jobs they left everything on the side and they had gone to follow Jesus but as often the case their motives were mixed while they wanted to just hang out with Jesus they also wanted to know where they were in the pecking order they wanted to know how that's going to help them in their long-term plans In Luke's account of the Last Supper, he tells that while they were reclining at the table, an argument broke out among the disciples. Luke chapter 22, verses 24 through 27. A dispute also also arose among them as to which of them would be considered the greatest. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, The greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. If we're going to take strides in cultivating servanthood, Christ-like servanthood, in our lives individually and collectively, we're going to have to be aware of something that's alive in every one of us. And that is that each one of us have a desire inside of us to be honored, to be recognized, to be important, and to be served. All of us have within us some desire to be served, to sit down and let someone take care of things for us for a while. And the kingdom of this world, the prevailing culture around us, operates with a principle of reciprocity where I'll I'll serve you, I'll, I'll, I'll help you, I'll scratch your back as long as... You scratch mine when it's my turn. I'll serve you, in other words. I'll I'll help you in some way as long as when it comes to my needing help, you'll come and serve me. I'll I'll invite you to my party as long as when you have a party, you invite me to yours. There's this ethic of reciprocity that goes on in our culture where I'll do something for you. I'll serve you really well because you're going to pay me back somehow. You'll pay me back. I had a conversation just this last week with some of my kids about that whole nature of tipping waiters and waitresses and what that looks like. And when a waiter or waitress brings food to you and what does it look like to tip them and why is that an important thing and how does that, how does that communicate uh, love or how does that communicate uh, an appreciation for what they've done. And some of the conversation was like, yeah, but they're just doing their job. 
they should just do it. And this, they, they should, I shouldn't have to tip them. I'm trying to teach an ethic of generosity and tipping, and that's a good thing to do. But there's this aspect of reciprocity. Well, they just did this. They should be paid that it's all fine and go from there. But the kingdom of God is different. Servanthood in the kingdom of God is not about reciprocity. It's not about I'm going to serve you in order to get something in return. I'm not going to invite you to my house in order so you invite me to your house. I'm not going to bring you to my party so that you bring me to your party. There's not about this reciprocity. Servanthood in the kingdom of God is because it is the right thing to do. Because Jesus doesn't serve in order to get a payback or a payoff. Jesus is one who serves because it's the right thing to do. Have you ever been invited to a lunch with somebody? where you may, Or somehow they're serving you, they come and they give you something, they do something for you, but you kind of read between the lines and it seems like they're trying to push an agenda on you? Like, let's go out to lunch. Let's, I just want to get to know you a little bit. And then pretty soon in that lunch or pretty soon in that time, they, it's pretty obvious that they just, they just want to push an agenda. They just want you to do something for them. I'll take you out to lunch. I'll, I'll buy your lunch stuff as long as you do this thing for me. Do you know what, how that felt? You remember how that felt? Remember how it felt manipulated? Do you remember how it felt like, wow, you, you didn't really want to go to lunch because <laughs> you care about me. You just wanted me to do something for you. Remember how that felt? Maybe I could be a little annoying this morning. Bonnie. I'll try to be lovingly annoying. Fair enough? You know how it felt to be manipulated when someone asked you out for something and it seemed like there were strings attached? You know how that felt? Have you ever done that to someone else? Have you ever been the one who with an agenda and you were being nice and you served them? But you were really, on, honestly, you were kind of doing it for a kickback, like maybe they'll help you out some other time. We're, we're in good company here because that's a little bit where the disciples were. They had mixed motives being with Jesus. They wanted to hang out with them. They, they wanted to learn from them, but they also wanted to see where they were going to line up in the pecking order. So we're in good company. The disciples were there. But can I gently nudge you and remind you that you and I as Christ people are called to be different we are called to a different kingdom with a different king with a different ethic with a different set of values because Jesus turns all this stuff on its head and he demonstrates an alternative way not one demanding recognition or reciprocity one recognizing the greatness of being servant jesus serves his disciples and those around him and he serves us because it's the right thing to do because it's right and if we're going to cultivate a culture of servanthood individually and in your family and in this church then we're going to have to wrestle with our motives what's our primary motive for serving I'm not saying it's going to be purely pure all the time. I, I get that. There's going to be mixed motives. I get that. I understand that. So take perfection off the table for a second. There's going to be mixed motives. But what is your primary motive for serving? To get recognition, to get popularity, to let people know how wonderful you are for serving and for giving of your time and your money and your talents? To have other people recognize those things? Or is your primary reason, your primary motive for serving because you're following the way of Jesus and it's simply right? Simply right. We're going to have to wrestle with our motives if we're going to grow in servanthood. The second thing to cultivate a way of servanthood in our lives is we're going to need to spend time with Jesus. We're just going to have to spend time with Jesus. Even if you just take a cursory look at the life of Jesus, just a flyover look at the life of Jesus that's recorded in the Gospels, you will see servanthood come up over and over and over. Healings and feedings and teachings and caring for people, going in to see their, their families, praying with them, 
eating with them. You will see a servanthood over and over the time with Jesus. And admittedly, here's just a complete shameless plug for this next upcoming apprenticeship course that's going to happen in October. Because there's going to be an apprenticeship course on the book of Mark where we simply take eight weeks and dive into following and looking at Jesus and what he did and where he went and how does, that, and how does his life confront our life. The course is going to go over eight weeks. It's going to start October 2nd. You have to register for it. It's not just kind of show up whenever you want to show up. It's going to be Wednesday nights. It'll be well worth your time. Well worth your time. There'll be another course offered later in the practice of Sabbath. There'll be other opportunities. And admitted, this is just a, a long infomercial to get you to think about this apprenticeship course coming up. But if we are going to cultivate a way or a, cult, a, a culture or an ethic of servanthood, we are going to need to spend time looking at jesus do you ever wonder why it's so easy for jesus to serve why he serves so faithfully time and time again there are tons of reasons i'm sure of it tons of reasons that we can get into but at least one distinct reason is because he understood his identity of who he is and he wasn't trying to puff up his ego or have other people think more highly of himself of him He wasn't trying to play the popularity game. He knew who he was. He knew where his identity is. And that led him to be able to be freed to serve and to serve faithfully. Listen again to a portion of the gospel or the reading in John that Bob read earlier. John chapter 13 verses 3 and 4. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he, could, he had come from God and was returning to God. Push pause right there. Jesus knew who he was, that the Father had placed all things under his authority and that he would, came from God and he was going back to God. Jesus knew who he was. And because he knew who he was, that set him up to be ready to faithfully serve. He knew who he was. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. He wasn't caught up in the popularity game. He wasn't caught up in the power struggle. He wasn't caught up in the games of the, the world around him. He knew who he was, and because he knew and he understood his identity of who he was, that it freed him up to take off his outer garments, to place a towel around his waist, and to serve those around him. Because he knew who he was. He wasn't interested in the org chart, pecking order game, or playing the popularity contest. He wasn't interested in all that. He had spent enough significant time with his father, and he had a rock-solid understanding of his identity and his specific calling, and it freed him from the bondage of playing games and trying to impress other people, and allowed him to stay in step with what the kingdom of God does and what it is, and whose ethic and his value systems is one of, of sacrificial servanthood rather than selfish wanting other people to serve him he got on his knees and he knelt before his disciples and he took their feet and he washed them and can i simply suggest to us this morning that as a practice in order to help us to cultivate a way of servanthood in our life to deepen our hearts as servants both individually and collectively that we would commit to spend some time with Jesus, and to see him and what he did. Spending time reading over the Gospels is crucial for us to develop a heart of servanthood, uh, to see the ways of Christ. Because, friends, our primary calling, our primary calling is to glorify God. To, to, to out of a secure understanding of who we are, to glorify God, to follow in his ways and when we do that we minister we care we serve other people so our primary calling is to glorify god to love god to to set our hearts on him alone and secondly to to love and to care and to serve other people to minister to them not to be admired by them but to serve them because we know who we are in christ and when we come to the lord's table When we come to the communion table, we see Christ, the servant. We see Christ, the one second person of the Trinity, the one eternal, who clothes himself in humanity, wraps a towel around him, and serves. And 
we are to be Christ-like servants when we leave the table. To care for one another. To love one another. And one practical way in which we grow that, beyond just a head nod and say, yeah, that's a good thing, is spend some time with Jesus. Just watch Him. Watch Him. Third and final quick thought is as we cultivate servanthood in our lives and the lives of our fellowship, and this may seem like a Debbie Downer this morning, but expect misery. Great, right? Oh, great. Bright guy tells me we're going to be miserable. Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes. I get it. It's a Debbie Downer. I get it. And it's tied to our motives. That's all true. Hear what I'm saying this morning. If you choose to walk the road of servanthood, not everyone will expect or will respond to it the way you expect them to. If you choose to walk the road of servanthood, not everyone will respond the way you want them to or the way you expect them to. Not all of them will even acknowledge it. Some of them won't even see it. Jesus knelt down on, at, the, for, at the Last Supper and knelt down and washed his feet. And as he walked or comes around the table, it comes to Peter, and Peter pushes him away. He says, I, I don't, we're not going to do this, Jesus. And Jesus has to correct him. Later, Judas Iscariot would betray Jesus, hand him over to be arrested. All of his disciples, but John, would leave him all by himself. Serving is costly. Not always a cause for joy and, and laughter and levity and Look how wonderful things are. Because you are going to serve someone. If you choose to walk the road of servanthood, you are going to choose to serve someone and they're not going to appreciate it. They're going to kind of brush it off. Someone may not even notice that you're serving you. They may walk right past it and not acknowledge it at all. Or... They may come into something you have set up really nicely and you've served really nicely and they may just completely, utterly destroy the house. And if you've got someone in your house that's like this high or smaller, <laughs> chances are you're going to serve all day and they're going to come in and they're not going to appreciate it the way you want them to appreciate it. They're just going to demand more Oreos. They're going to be ungrateful. They're going to be snot-nosed punks at times. I get it. I get it. And I've heard people say, and autobiographically, regretfully, I've been one who's thought this myself. I'm not going to serve them anymore if they're not going to be, they're not going to show gratitude. To heck with them. I'm done we got a wonderful ministry here at the church, Spread the Bread and Thread, where people come in a couple times a year and we serve them. And they find themselves in need of food and clothing. And many who come are very grateful. But some of them come with a, a sense of entitlement. And they just want to get their stuff and go. And when they look at what the things that we have, they kind of, well, don't you have this? And why not this? And they seem to be ungrateful. Not all, but some. Sometimes we're going to serve people in our families or at work and our servant, our, our service is going to go unnoticed. Or people will just find things to complain about. Well, why didn't you do it this way? And they'll seem really bitter by our servanthood. And here's the point. You can't control how someone responds to your serving. You and I cannot control how someone responds to how we serve them. And we follow Christ. We follow the servant who was brushed aside and his servanthood wasn't always appreciated. It actually got him to be spat at, slapped in the face, and rejected. But you and I follow Christ at the table and we see a servant regardless of the outcome who serves. 
If you and I serve in order to control or manipulate someone's behavior or in order to get them to respond a certain way, then we will be dis- disappointed almost all the time. We can't control how someone responds to our servanthood, but we serve because it is the right thing to do. And we follow Christ, the servant. We don't do it in a way to control them. We don't do it in a way to manipulate them. We don't do it in a way to get them to do something for us in return. Our prevailing culture does that, but the kingdom of God does not do that. The kingdom of God and the ethic and the value system of the kingdom of God is serving because it is right to serve. It is better to serve. And friends, If you choose to go the road of servanthood, Christ-like servanthood, sometimes it's not going to be enjoyable. Sometimes you're going to be cleaning up vomit in the middle of the night. And no one's going to know. No one's going to know. But we serve not out of a motivation to get their response, but out of glorifying God, because following the ways of Jesus is the right thing to do. Here's what I want us to to be confronted by this morning. Because our self-righteousness and our need and desire to be noticed and recognized and let other people know how great I am, our ways of that are confronted by Jesus, the servant at the table. My self-righteousness is confronted by the selfless, sacrificial servanthood of Christ that we see at the table. So when you take communion this morning, when you take the bread and the cup, I want us to come with that in mind. I want us to think about the experience of Christ, the servant, at that meal. And how does that experience of Christ the servant form you to care and to serve those who won't be thankful, who won't show gratitude, who will even feel entitled to your servanthood. But how does your experience of Christ the servant at the table shape you to be a servant in Christ-like manner wherever God is sending you, to whomever God is sending you? So when you take the bread and the cup this morning, we take it in recognition of the servanthood of Christ. We're going to do it differently this morning than we've done in the past. Rather than coming forward and being served the elements, we're going to take the elements to you. And you're going to look at the person next to you and we're going to serve each other. And as the elements come to you and you pass the elements from one person to the next, rather than just kind of passing it down the row and just kind of keep on going, look at the person next to you and as you bring the bread to them, you say, this is the body of Christ, which is given for you. And you serve them. And you allow yourself to be served by the people near you. And as the cup comes down your row and you look at the person next to you, you hold the cup out and say, this is the blood of Christ which is poured out for you. And we serve one another, and we serve one another because we follow Christ, the servant. You can eat the bread, you can drink the juice whenever you like, you can eat it right then and there. Have a moment of just reflecting on the servanthood of Jesus as we serve one another this morning. And may that experience shape you to be a Christ-like servant to wherever and to whomever the Lord is calling you to this week. If you would bow your heads and close your eyes and prepare for our liturgy just to have a moment of reflection. The Apostle Paul tells us that it's good for us to reflect and to prepare for communion. It's not an aspect of reflecting to see if we're worthy of this, but it's an aspect of reflecting to see the sacredness in this meal that we encounter the risen Christ and the way of the kingdom in this meal. In a moment, we'll read you or lead you through the the liturgy that will be on the screens. But just for now, just quiet your heart and reflect on Christ the servant. And what is that? What is he calling you to do? If you're serving communion, you can come and prepare and get ready and then we'll lead you.
I do want to give your attention to the screens as we go through our communion liturgy this morning. The Lord is with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Father God, we praise you always and everywhere because of who you are and how you work in all things to bring about your good plan for creation. It is with thanksgiving that we come to this, your table, and remember the perfect sacrifice of Jesus for us. We gather this morning at your table from all backgrounds of life, asking that you meet us here, form us into your people, a people who reflect the ways of your kingdom. We will praise you, almighty and eternal God, now and forevermore. We join our voices with all your people and all of creation to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, 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 holy. God of power and might, Light. heaven, heaven and, and earth are, are full, full of your glory. glory. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, each of you. For this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup. After giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, In this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sins. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. May our lives be resurrection lives, always proclaiming the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ, Christ is has risen, risen, and Christ, Christ will come again. again. Let's pray together. Almighty, everlasting God, we thank you for your grace and mercy, that you would rescue us from our sin and call us your own. We praise you this morning for the gift of Jesus, for his life, death, and resurrection. May this experience shape us to have the same humble servanthood and shape us to be your people in this world. Amen. The table is ready. 